updates and be part of our conversation squad. Yes, uh, these are dubious elections that were held on the 8th of February, that is to say this earlier this month. These uh, have produced, well, let's look at the lead up to the elections. So these elections were delayed by about a year, during which time there was an interim government. That interim government was subservient to the main powers that be, which um, in Pakistan is called the establishment and would normally be called the army elsewhere. Now, this government was supposed to take an entirely neutral stand on who was to take who was to take charge of pakistan subsequently it was a caretaker government headed by a hitherto unknown person kakar and it was supposed to be nonpartisan but it turned out to be definitely partisan and partisan in the sense that um, there was a desire to bring a particular political party up front, or rather to make sure that another political party, that is to say the PTI of Imran Khan, would not make it to the forefront. And uh, therefore, the, the playing field was definitely tilted against Imran Khan and his PTI. Now, that became evident in so many different ways. So for one, Imran Khan, who was um, earlier prime minister, and then um, he was um, in a no confidence vote removed from power. He was uh, at one point um, extremely popular. Then he lost his popularity. And that was because of his misgovernance. But then he came into conflict with the Pakistan army. And by successive steps, he um, lost control over the government. And then uh, when the no confidence motion was passed against him, thereafter he dissolved the national, he dissolved the provincial assemblies. Now elections should have been called immediately 90 days thereafter, but those didn't happen. Instead, nas new national elections were called, but uh, one didn't know exactly when that would happen. Finally, those elections did happen on the 8th of February, but as I said earlier, it was not a level playing field. A lot of people felt that the outcomes were going to be fixed, and fixed in uh, definite proportions. Now, one of the main things that happened, which prevented the participate, the direct participation of the PTI was that it was denied its election symbol. The election symbol, as you might expect, was the cricket bat. But uh, the Supreme Court of Pakistan ruled that the bat would not be allowed as, as an election symbol. And therefore, members of the PTI were told to run as independents. And as independents, they would then um, use one of uh, uh, the many unrecognized or unrecognizable symbols, such as a lamp or a, or, or a pencil or whatever, but not the cricket bat. So this meant that PTI as a party could not be could not be considered as running for the elections. However, the Nawaz group, the PMLN as it is called, and the Pakistan People's Party and um, other political parties retained their symbols. It was, I think, manifest injustice in the sense that. Uh, Okay, the Supreme Court had ruled that uh, 
Imran Khan's party could not participate as a political party in the elections because it had not held internal elections. On the other hand, one could have uh, asked, well, there were other political parties which uh, had not held internal elections either. And so how come they were allowed to run? This point is a very powerful point, and it uh, certainly put the PTI at a disadvantage. But all said and done, when the elections were, when the elections results came out, the PTI, through its independence, bagged something like 93 seats. The PMLN, the Nawaz group, it uh, bagged something like 78 seats. I could be wrong, plus or minus one over here. And the People's Party, a little less than 60. So now what that meant was that in spite of the enormous amount of effort that was put into fixing the elections, nonetheless, the PTI turned out to be the dominant party in the elections. Now, one has to now see this in... Uh, now, let us now see how this... Um, Let's analyze what this means in terms of Pakistan's future. And let's also analyze how the PTI managed to bag such a large number of votes. Well, um, the fact is that when Imran Khan was in power and he was making bad decisions one after the other, and I could uh, list a few of them, to you, there was a massive misgovernance of the economy. The economy under Nawaz Sharif, who had preceded him, was doing rather well. Um, it uh, the 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 U.S. dollar versus the Pakistani rupee parity was um, at 180 rupees or so at that time, but uh, steadily the economy was st losing steam. And th there are many reasons for that. But a lot of that has to do with wrong decisions, with misgovernance, with uh, putting wrong people in power, putting his cronies, his uh, sycophants in power, as opposed to, as opposed to those with a degree of competence. There was also a complete mess up of uh, the way Imran Khan had handled foreign policy. And now, uh, to give you examples from that, he was uh, constantly pointing at the United States as a source of his problems. He was fully with the Taliban and uh, stood up to his former name, his moniker as Taliban Khan. He um, was militant on the issue of Kashmir and uh, in fact um, on had announced that every Friday there would be a protest outside government buildings to um, demand that uh, um, that article 370 be repealed and so forth. There was also the issue that he appointed the chief minister of Punjab who was a thoroughly incompetent person and did so at the behest of his wife, et cetera, et cetera. Furthermore, the, the promises that he had made at the outset, one of them was astonishing that he would end corruption in 90 days. Now, nothing close to that happened. In fact, according to Transparency International, Pakistan dropped two places as a consequence of um, Imran Khan, during Imran Khan's rule. And to my mind, the most, uh, his most egregious mistake, or I should say crime, was that he, he, he took Pakistani education, revised the curriculum, and made the regular school curriculum more or less parallel to that of the madrasa curriculum. And that has very far-reaching uh, effects, will have these effects far into the future. So I could go on on that. But clearly, here was a person 
not competent for being in the highest office in Pakistan. But really, the pu really push came to shove when um, he started crossing swords with the army. Now, at that time, the the people who got him in power, and there were two generals in particular. There was General Bajwa, who was chief of army staff, and there was General Faiz Hamid, who was the head of the ISI, and he was chummy with both with both of them. However, seeing the misgovernance, General Bajwa uh, tried to correct course at various points, perhaps in a very ham-handed way. But then came the issue of who was to be the next head of the ISI. And it is at that point, and, and then subsequently, who would be the next chief of army staff after Bajwa retired. And at that point, Imran Khan crossed swords with uh, General Bajwa and uh, asserted that he and not the army would decide. So thereafter, it was uh, down the steep slippery slope. And uh, then the establishment uh, decided that, uh, well, enough is enough, and we must get this guy out before he, um, before he, um, uh, before everything comes undone. And the divorce happened in, in a clever way. The, the army cultivated opposition leaders, gave them space, encouragement, and that's what led to the vote of no confidence and then Imran Khan made the fatal mistake of uh, disbanding the assemblies. And uh, then a further step happened that when the army, at the behest of the army, various cases were, were brought, uh, criminal cases were brought against Imran Khan. And he was um, first under house arrest. At that point, he gave the orders for, he encouraged the, the, his supporters to attack um, the army physically. And so on uh, the 9th of May last year, there was um, a major attack. And this was at a corps commander's uh, official residence. There was a uh, uh, burning, uh, the, the, the the house was partially burnt, and that's the point at which the army reacted. And then uh, today we see that he's in jail, that he's running things from behind the scenes and so forth. Okay, so it's very clear that the army was and is against Imran Khan. And uh, in spite of that, it so transpires that Imran Khan's party is now the leading party in Pakistan. And this is through a dubious election. Now, uh, liberals in Pakistan are outraged. And they say that this is a travesty. This is uh, not the way that a democracy should operate. And they're completely right in that. Well, so are Imran Khan's supporters. They too are outraged. and. While I completely understand their outrage, there are things that one needs to keep in mind as we think of what lies ahead. So, looking at the time that Imran Khan was in power, let's notice a number of features that characterized his, his time in power. Number one, he had acted in a manner that was thoroughly against democratic norms. He used abusive language, coarse, crude language against all his political opponents, calling them chor and daku and other epithets. He jailed them. He persecuted 
those who their followers he uh, gagged the press and he used so often the phrase that the army and i are on the same page that i've lost count of that at every point he would say there's no difference between what i think and what the establishment thinks and indeed that was reflected in in uh, everything that he did so they were indeed on the same page and at no point did he challenge the army uh, for its massive intrusion into the country's business matters into the appointment of a retired senior military officials as CEO, CEOs of corporations. At no point did he challenge the appropriation of last, vast amounts of lands by the military. And indeed, he was on the same page as the military. Now, today, the, the vote that he gets is as an anti-establishment politician as an anti-army politician, but in fact, there was, they, the, he was exactly on the same page as, on the, as the army. And even today, he does not challenge the army on this matter. So let's keep in mind that this is what he was when he was in power. But today, his supporters still have their minds fixed on him as somebody who is uh, not a dynastic politician and somebody who opposes the powers that be. And so that is the success. That's the secret of his success, of the fact that the PTI today is the leading political party in Pakistan, in spite of the fact that its leader is in jail. Now, there's a very unfortunate thing that has happened in Pakistan and which is the rhetoric that has been directed against the political establishment in general. They have been characterized as dissolutes, as, as crooks, as uh, thieves. So chor, daku, that kind of epithet has been used so often that today it is hard for a politician to to say that he's a political leader and not inspire disrespect. The army, on the other hand, has uh, not been attacked by either Imran Khan or the political establishment in that way. What's even more unfortunate for Pakistan is that today there is no institution which inspires respect among ordinary people that people can point to and say ah we will believe what the head of that institution says and this includes most unfortunately the supreme court and the judiciary as a whole these the so imran khan has effectively torn the country into two there are those who support him, and there are those who bitterly oppose him. This is true for the judiciary. This is true for the bureaucracy. And I, I am pretty sure, I say pretty sure because I don't know it for a matter of fact, but that the army is also split from within, some supporting Imran Khan, and the majority now with the chief of army staff. Now, this means that the elections which were just held were also dubious. They were fixed. And in spite of that, Imran Khan emerges as the winner. So we are in a very paradoxical situation where uh, the establishment has in fact re revealed its weakness. They had wanted Nawaz Sharif to be prime minister of Pakistan. And this in spite of the fact that uh, 
in 2017, the establishment had, had engineered his removal. And it was so clear and obvious at that time that they were opposed to Nawaz Sharif that they, it, it, it simply couldn't be hidden then. They had uh, selected Imran Khan as, as, as the chosen one. And, and so today we see that the army, uh, well, it got its first wish. It, it got its wish of putting Imran Khan in power. For three and a half years, he ruled Pakistan. And when I say ruled Pakistan, I mean uh, like a king. It was uh, totally against um, uh, democratic norms. He consulted no one. He imposed his decisions like a dictator did, and eventually fell foul of the army. Okay, so but the army did get its wish back in 2018, in the 2018 elections. But in the 2024 elections, what we see is that uh, the army could not, for all its efforts, get Nawaz Sharif back in power. And in fact, Nawaz Sharif has now decided to step out of um, the spotlight and instead wants his, <clears throat> excuse me, wants his daughter, Maryam Nawaz, to be the chief minister of Punjab, which is a very powerful, powerful position. And he wants his brother, Shahbaz Sharif, to be the prime minister of Pakistan. And uh, now there's a deal there's a coalition government with uh, principally the Nawaz Muslim League and the People's Party in which the deal is that uh, the president of Pakistan will be Asif Ali Zardari. And so um, after these provincial assemblies are put in place, uh, that's the form of government that we shall see. To summarize, the... 2024 elections have produced a coalition government with um, rather shaky foundations. And because of the fact that there were so many independents and those independents then chose to join one or the other party. And in fact, that process is still going on at the present time. What we see is that the the prime minister and his cabinet are going to be opposed tooth and nail by the opposition. And it's unclear what this parliament will be able to achieve and how long this government will be able to last. At the time, at the present time, Pakistan is beset with, uh, with serious difficulties, particularly economic difficulties. There is just under eight billion dollars of foreign of, of dollars available for for Pakistan's for paying off Pakistan's uh, debt loans. Now the total debt, the total meaning the, the 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 foreign as well as domestic debt stands at something like two hundred and thirty billion dollars, and with just eight billion dollars, that means that. There's less than uh, four weeks or six weeks um, for, for import, for meeting import requirements. And that means one is just skirting at the edge of default. The only way that Pakistan's leaders have found of uh, staving off uh, this, this uh, crunch has been to take loans from the IMF. Now, the IMF... International Monetary Fund has become extraordinarily important for Pakistan. It should be emergency medicine and no more than that, but it has become the, I should say, like the bedrock of Pakistan's economy. And that's, that means that anytime it sneezes, the, the country shakes. In, let's recall that when Imran Khan was in power, he said, 
I am never going to go to the IMF. He said that in his first, before, the, before he was elected, and he said that after he was elected, but it soon became very clear that Pakistan would default on its loans. And so he, uh, he, he was eventually forced into going to the IMF. Now, once again, Pakistan is going to the IMF. And what the IMF does is that it requires countries to cut back on public subsidies, which means that uh, prices of electricity, of gas, and uh, particularly of uh, petrol and diesel, they go up. Now, when they go up, then in then the cost of commodities increases, that is inflation rises, which means that a government rapidly becomes unpopular and then has to face a street situation. And now this is exactly what lies ahead. So the problem is that a shaky coalition government is in power. It is going to be faced with a, with a desperate economic situation. The only way that they will be able to survive is to once again go to the IMF and agree to its conditionalities, some of which I would say are quite reasonable. That's at one level. Now, at another level, you see the challenges that lie that are inherent within the way that the Pakistani state system is set up. The army would like to not just uh, keep its control and extend it, and it is presently extending that by wanting to go into agriculture, into mechanized agriculture. Now, that means you take lands away from someone or you take the water away. And both of these are meeting resistance. In Sindh, something like 52,000 acres have been given over to the army for use in mechanized commercial agriculture. And this has caused resentment over there. The continuing dispossession of uh, ordinary people for the DHAs, Defense Housing Associations, those have also created re uh, uh, resistance. Then there's the regional issue. Pakistan's entire politics has been Punjab-centered. And uh, what we see now is that, again, the coalition government has as its principal partner the PMLN. So it's, again, totally Punjab-centered. Uh, the, the, the elections in Balochistan revealed uh, astonishing results, and it seems it seems that they were fixed much more than elections in the rest of the country. Baloch nationalists have been, have been excluded from power over there. And this means that their, partic their participation in Pakistan's political life will be small, which means that this will fuel further nationalist sentiment. And uh, this comes... Just as the Baloch launched a, a walk to Islamabad, and uh, here they protested for weeks on end in, in bitterly cold weather, but were spurned by the, coalition, by the caretaker government. And should they repeat it, the same, will, the same fate will meet them from the present elected government. And so that creates a further sense of alienation. So to summarize, I think I'm going to end over here um, and then hope for questions from the audience. The government that is up ahead it does not look as if it is capable of making important fundamental decisions that could change the fate of Pakistan. Now, what could they be? Let me list uh, three of them. Number one, to fix the economy 
And I say, if, when I say fix the economy, I mean in, uh, in, in, in the months to come, in the weeks to come, in, in the months to come, it has to change the way in which investment is made. And presently, anyone who's got any money puts it into real estate because real estate prices practically double every year or every two years. And so this is where people then invest. But that's wholly unproductive. And now this has been going on for, for decades. And the result of this has been that there's no money for, um, for, for setting up industries. So now the question is, will a government like this be able to, to fix such a fundamental problem? And uh, I would doubt it. Secondly, the reason that productivity um, measured how, however, however, is so low is because of the low level of skills that Pakistani, that Pakistanis receive in their schools, colleges, and universities. And this was made considerably worse by Imran Khan through his imposition of the single national curriculum, which said that, which called for a massive dose of religion into the school curriculum to the point that, well, uh, today I would say that the public school curriculum in uh, Pakistan and the madrasa curriculum are practically identical. Now that is something that is poison for the country's future growth. But it's not easy to back away from that because once you bring religion into politics, and once you bring religion into education, to, to disturb that link is calls for something very major. And I don't see this coalition government as being able to do that. And finally, here is something that is perhaps just as fundamental, which is that Pakistan must move away from conceiving of itself as a security state, one which is obsessed by keeping a big army to prevent a big neighbor from invading it. That idea has to be sacrificed, has to be done away with, and Pakistan needs to become a normal country in that regard. So for this reason, it must now make uh, friends with all its neighbors. And its neighbors are India, Iran. Now with Iran, Pakistan has bad relations. In fact, um, there's quite a bit of firing across the, across the border. The Iranians have launched drone attacks into Pakistani territory and Pakistan has fired artillery across into Iran. But now there's another issue, which is that Afghanistan is also decidedly unfriendly to Pakistan, in spite of the fact that Pakistan helped the Taliban into power. Now, these were colossal bungles of foreign policy, and they could have been foretold, but of course, nobody asked people, uh, n n the, those in the establishment are least worried about those outside, and they do what they want to. They put the Taliban there and now are reaping the consequences, the horrendous consequences of that in the form of daily attacks by the Tehrik-e Taliban Pakistan on Pakistani armed forces and the police. So anyway, I could go on. Um, it's now an open question of how well this coalition government will be able to perform, whether it will be able to get loans from the IMF as a first step, what it will do on all the, the, the issues that I've outlined, and uh, let's wait and see. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, that, that's been a masterly analysis of what is happening in Pakistan, and I'm sure that we'll have uh, many questions to ask from, from the India point of view. Uh, and you've really, 
I think you have not given a very encouraging picture in that sense. Uh, but I have a, the first question which you did allude to, but I want more specifically. When we say that the establishment is interfering in the electoral process, how does it interfere? It interferes in the choice of candidates, in the allocation of resources, or uh, it interferes in the voting pattern. How does this happen? Okay, um, let's uh, look at it one by one. First of all, the denial of the batting of the bat as the election symbol was very important. It uh, essentially removed the PTI as one of the contender, as one of the contending po uh, political parties. Then those candidates who were absolutely sure that they had won, and in fact, uh, they put up documentary evidence in the form of, uh, uh, of what is called the Form 45. So the Form 45 is what is filled in by those at a polling station. Okay, so to, to be more specific, uh, in my neighborhood here, I went, I um, gave my vote on a slip of paper. That, those, paper, those slips were then gathered together and before the appointed political agents, those appointed by the candidates themselves, they were counted. And the results were put on a certain thing called Form 45. Now, those Form 45s, they were photographed with the mobile cameras. And so the candidates have, have um, records of that. And yet, what appeared at the other end, that is where they were transmitted, was a different Form 45. So there was tampering at that level. Okay, then another important um, indication of tampering is that the, the mobile phones were turned off strategically just as the voting was happened, was ha voting had happened, and then they were turned off for m more than 30 hours subsequently. What this meant was that um, it, it became impossible for all except the chosen ones to send their voters. Because, you know, in, in the confusion that happens without mobile communication, uh, this, this uh, made the polling very difficult. And this worked to the advantage of those who were selected, and it worked to the disadvantage of those who were not as well organized. Pervez, um, one question if I can ask. Uh, the fact that uh, there was such a groundswell of support for candidates associated with Imran Khan's party, that is against the establishment's uh, preferences, does that tell you that maybe things are changing, that maybe the establishment cannot now onwards have its way, or is that reading too much into a single election uh, outcome? I mean, I ask this also because you say that at the same time, Imran Khan is very much part of the establishment. He's not been coming out against the army. And yet people expressed a vote. Was it for his party or was it against the establishment which didn't want his party's candidates to win? So what's very clear is that the army establishment does not want Imran Khan, and it views him uh, it views him with distaste, and particularly after the events of May 9th, where the core commander's house was attacked. On the other hand, the army does not have an ideological problem with Imran Khan. They share the same values, the same ethos, the same greed for power, and the same lack of vision for Pakistan. So on, ide on ideological grounds, the two are completely the same. But looking at the supporters of Imran Khan, that's a totally different thing. 
The supporters of Imran Khan see him as against the army establishment for the best of reasons. For the fact that the Pakistan army has uh, grabbed the country's resources, natural resources, the a big chunk of the budget, the lands, the minerals, and whatever. So the the public is is definitely resentful of that. But what the public does not realize is that Imran Khan has never had a problem with the army stealing the country's resources. So here is a contradiction. And so this then really brings to mind the question of how mature an electorate is when it does not debate issues such as so important as this. No, the, the, there is an elephant in the room. Uh, I'm talking about the Kashmir issue. How much of that issue is discussed in Pakistan politics and in the uh, setup in, in the campaigning and everything? Do, are all part, do all parties say the same thing about it? Or even there, there is a variation? <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question because no party, not the PPP, not the PML, not the jamaat e islami not JUIF, none of them differs on this by the slightest. And I, I should have added, of course, the PTI on this. Now, they all know, anyone with any good sense knows that the Kashmir issue is really a dead issue. You cannot possibly, through force of arms, change the situation. Neither India nor Pakistan. After all, these are two nuclear-armed countries, and uh, the for both countries, there's a red line. That is, don't try and change the line of control, else all hell is going to break loose. And... Now, in the age of nuclear weapons, I, even if India has a superior military force, let's say even by a factor of 10 as compared to Pakistan, it still cannot, it still cannot grab Gilgit, Baltistan or parts that it claims are part of India. And nor can Pakistan do anything in Kashmir now. And in fact, the only thing that I will credit the Pakistan army with is that after, let's say, 2017, 18, whatever, the insurgency levels have dropped to zero, pretty much close to zero. Now, Hafiz Saeed is in jail with a 30-year sentence. Very good. I say he should have been put there beforehand. I say that it should not have been the pressure of the FATF, the federal, the the uh, you know the um, the restrictions that were brought on Pakistan for uh, terror funding. So we should have done it. Pakistan should have done it, irrespective of the pressures on it. But anyway, it's a good thing that it has happened, and so now Kashmir should be something that now should be regarded as, as a dead issue. But the political parties dare not say that. But as long as they're quiet about it, it's fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are, just, uh, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, we just have uh, for a little over 10 minutes left because uh, Professor Woodboy has to go for another engagement. Um, can I ask a couple of questions on behalf of the audience? So one is, uh, again, related to the elections by Professor T.V. Gopal Anna University in Chennai. The, does the election show that the election symbol is not really a concern? You know, I think what he's asking is with reference to uh, the fact that, uh, you know, independence uh, won. Uh, and uh, another question is, you know, what is the role of the U.S. in propping up the present regime in Pakistan? I would like to add okay. U.S. and China. Yeah. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> the election symbol is important. Um, and it's it's important for, for um, particularly those people who can't read. 
And now, if there's an independent candidate who has, let's say, a leaf as his or her election symbol, now, unless you go and, and tell that person that this is the PTI candidate, he or she will, the, the, the voter will not know. On the other hand, if you put a bat over there, then immediately that is recognizable as Imran Khan's party. So uh, it was important. On the issue of whether the United States or China had a role in um, bringing this government to power, I'd say pretty much no. First of all, with China, it is it is so immediate that one doesn't even need to comment because China is really hands off, hands off Pakistan politically, not economically, but politically. China doesn't care one hoot who comes to power. If, if it's Shabazz Sharif, fine. If it's Imran Khan, fine. If it's even Jamaat Islami or whoever, because the China-Pakistan relationship is a very different from, from that of the United States and Pakistan. Now, as far as the United States goes, I'd say it's lost most, it's lost its former interest in Pakistan after the Taliban won in Afghanistan. And so there's only a peripheral degree of interest. And yes, you could say that uh, the U.S. would definitely prefer having Shabazz Sharif or Bilawal Bhutto or whoever as Prime Minister of Pakistan, as compared to Imran Khan, who um, is viscerally anti-American. So in that, but uh, there is absolutely no evidence of the U.S. doing anything uh, important, effective in uh, either removing Imran Khan, he went because of his follies, not because of external intervention. And nor is there any evidence of the U.S. trying to influence the present elections. One, oh, 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 there's a question here. Uh, do you see a link between real estate-based politics uh, and, and the economy, which has an impact, or impact on the weakening of institutions and democracy? Real estate has uh, brought a huge amount of wealth to land grabbers. And of course, the biggest land grabber is the Pakistan army. The DHAs are the prime example of that, but there, there, is, uh, um, there are others also associated with the army or with army backing. And that is a source of great resentment. In terms of what that does to the economy, um, as, as I try to emphasize, it takes away investment. Does it impose upon democracy? Well, in the sense um, that those lands that are occupied now by the housing societies were not empty lands. People lived on them. They were bulldozed off. And this is the case for, uh, for the Beria town. There's a whole town. There are towns, actually all over Pakistan, uh, run by this, by this uh, billionaire, Malik Riaz, who is in cahoots with the army and with the local administration and the bureaucracy, and who's, made fat, who's probably the richest man in Pakistan. And all that money made by throwing people off their native lands. Oops. There's one question here uh, from uh, Subhashis that uh, you kind of covered it in your talk briefly. That does the army continue to be a single entity or are there different factions now with their own different interests and even ideologies? Ah, that's a very interesting question. I wish I had a, <laughs> a, a comprehensive answer to that. But, you know, in terms of the army so soldiers that I've talked to, the ones who are in CHN, the ones who are fighting the TTP, those guys are very simple. I'd say some of them are very sweet people. And they are um, they also read quite a bit. And they um, immediately recognize me and 
some of them came to me and this is uh, at, at different places that I meet them and and they uh, are somewhat aware of what the high command does and the amount of money that the high command rakes in but uh, like good army men they don't question that they say okay this is above our pay scale we we don't get into such things in terms of whether there's a split within the army yes there definitely was on the matter of Imran Khan and that is why the army reacted so fiercely extremely fiercely to the events of May 9th when the core commander's house was put on fire that was with the connivance of people within the army uh, placed at a high level. And now a mutiny is something that no army can uh, ever tolerate. How yeah. big, the, how, how many mutineers there are, I don't know. But yes, it was the mutiny that was feared. One interesting question from Priya Hassan. Uh, what are the parallels you see in the Pakistan political scene today and the present one in India, especially in the context of religion and politics? But she's asking specifically with changes to the school curriculum. Okay, so I don't know the Indian school curriculum in detail, but what do I, but what I do see is the communalization of politics in India, which follows what which follows the path that Pakistan followed for, for decades. So citizenship is decided on the basis of your, of your religion. And in the case of Pakistan, even your, your sect within Islam. So certainly the Ahmadis have been expelled from that, but the Christians and the Hindus and uh, even the Shias don't feel that they are that they are that they are uh, first grade citizens of Pakistan. I see a trend towards that. I don't know how deep it is. I think the Ram Mandir episode has certainly underscored the the intrusion of religion into politics in the Indian context. And the fact that mosques are being pulled down and uh, mandar is being uh, put in their place, it shows that India may not be very different from Pakistan in the future. Certainly at the present moment, I would say that India affords a more hospitable environment to its minorities, to its non-Hindu minority, as compared to Pakistan. But uh, should this continue, I think it would be then a mirror of Pakistan. Uh, uh, I, I would differ here because I think one thing we take credit in India is the purity of our election process. I think that uh, that has been remained fairly independent and uh, across the country. So, uh, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. One yeah. last question, uh, Parvez, if you have time. Uh, this is from Harbans Mukhya in Delhi. Uh, the political parties in Pakistan don't appear to constitute alternatives to enable the electorate to make real choices. Then what choices do people have to challenge the establishment? It's a big question, but maybe you can give a brief answer. Yeah, it's an important question. Uh, look, uh, the... The political parties are intellectually bankrupt. They don't have a way out for Pakistan. They, they don't have an economic program, a social program, uh, an education program that makes sense. Yeah, all of them came up with manifestos two weeks before the elections, but they didn't say how they were going to fulfill those goals. So that, to my mind, is is very disturbing. It's uh, It shows that the political parties are also not ready for a full-fledged democracy. One can just hope for evolution. So then the question is, who do people vote for? And now in Sindh, for example, you saw that the entire vote, or most of the vote, 
went for the People's Party, which is a Sindhi party. In KPK, in formerly NWFP, you saw that uh, Imran Khan's party won and won substantially and they're going to make a provincial government over there by getting the independents to join together and under an umbrella group. And that's, again, ethnic because it's the Pathans. The Pathans have got together, the Sindhis have got together. And uh, in uh, Punjab, well, Punjab remains fractured. Now, uh, you see, very interesting. This is the first time that the Punjabi establishment has, has been broken from within. The Punjabi establishment is what decides Pakistan's national priorities. It's not four provinces that make Pakistan. It's actually Punjabistan. Pakistan is Punjabistan. The, rather, the others have to follow it. And so when Punjabistan gets fractured, well, then that's telling you something different lies ahead. And finally, one point. Yeah, um, yes, I know that Vikramji pointed out that uh, that uh, the election process in in India is uh, is um, is intact, whereas that in Pakistan is not. It's true, but on the other hand, majoritarian can still exist in those in that situation, and if the majority have decided that they want to crush the minority, well, that's terrible. That means that democracy has ultimate, has failed. Even if it's the majority that has exercised its choice, then we come back to what happened in Germany. Yes. I mean, the last question, uh, I have uh, Sunita is asking a question saying that, do you predict a worsening of the situation with respect to India in the sense that what she wants to know is that if you don't have an economically sound neighbor, then will there be a fallout of Pakistan's uh, troubles on India? And will they look at it as an alternative? Oh, on, on this issue, I'm slightly optimistic. I think there will be better relations between India and Pakistan with this government in power, the one under Shabazz Sharif, uh, advised by Nawaz Sharif, hopefully. And uh, now you see India and Pakistan have grown separately. And uh, now, as any sensible person can say that the Kashmir issue is not going to move. And so if there is a realization of this in, um, in the top levels of government, of the establishment, well, then we can hope for a kind of normalization of, of ties between India and Pakistan. Normalization, I mean, let's give people visas so that they can cross, a, cross over easily. Let's start trading with each other. It's a disgrace that we trade next to nothing and yet have things to sell to each other. And of course, um, Pakistan will need to downgrade the amount it spends on defense. It, now, it doesn't need that much money to maintain a defense against India. After all, it's got nuclear weapons, good or bad. I've always opposed nuclear weapons. But one saving grace is that once uh, a country has them, then uh, it should feel more secure. And so these are objective reasons why there should be a better period uh, between India and Pakistan relative to the past.